Hey, happy, 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 happy September to you. I know it's already the 6th of September. Yes, it's the 6th of September and it's already five days or six days into this month. And um, it's not too late to say happy new month, September. If it wasn't for copyright rules, uh, we'd have taken that Kirk Franklin September song and put it at the intro so that you know that we're in the month of September. There's a ring to September because it tells you like we're already now like decelerating. Tunateremka. Huh? So you come to me the right English word. But we are teremkaing towards December, a season that is holiday full. Um, and we pray that this month will be amazing. We pray that this month will be full of God's blessings to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to um, our service. We have been in existence as a church for six months as of today. It's exactly six months since collective worship started out, uh, uh, started out as a church. Two years and six months since we started out as a ministry. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for your love, for your support, for everything that you do uh, to get this ministry going. Thank you every, to everyone who uh, supports us in one way or another. We say thank you. Our success is your success. Our joy is your joy. And we thank God for you. And I say thank you to all our volunteers. Uh, we had that church that started and then we were thrust into doing things online. And we've been doing things online ever since. I want to say thank you to our camera crew, uh, Q and Jere, and to our sound team, Irosh and uh, Humphrey Kidero and uh, Hamisi and, and Caleb, everyone who takes care um, of us behind the scenes, we say thank you to you, to our worship team, our team of volunteers, our setup crew, everybody who runs behind the scenes to make this happen. May God bless you. Our success truly and really is your success. I also want to say thank you to our worship team, everybody, um, you know, who works in, in, in behind the scenes in our worship and our band. We appreciate you guys as well. And we just wanted to say thank you for everything that you do. What's up next? You know, we've been home. Are we opening back? Are we going back in, in you know, in, 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 in starting to do services uh, in person? Not yet. Not yet. Our services are still going to be online and at least until the end of this month then we'll be able to see what the best way to respond is depending on how the situation will be in our country we are praying for our country we are praying for our world and we are praying for you and we know that god will prevail allow me without saying anything more than that to welcome the amazing and super 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 gifted leader of worship that we are blessed to have and that's none other than Lujang to take us into a session of worship as we start our service today. Lujang, over to you. Hey Collectives, thank you for tuning in, for joining, for watching, for subscribing and just worshipping with us this uh, past several Sundays. Here we are again, just sit back or stand up however you want to worship with us, okay? You can jump, you can do whatever, just follow through and sing along, okay? And have fun in the presence of God. No shadow you won't light, mountain you won't climb, coming after me. No wall you won't hit, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light, mountain you won't climb,
What a powerful song. Just to be reminded that it's the breath of God that is in your lungs. Like, whether you feel like you're having high highs or low lows, it's the breath of God in your lungs. And that makes you special. That makes you a child of God. What a reminder. I love the song that uh, Lujang started with, The Reckless Love of God. There's no, there's, no, there's no shadow you won't light up. There's no mountain you won't kick down when you're coming after me and as if that song is not enough god proved it to us that in the time that it needed his son to die for you and i even that didn't hold back what he could do for us what a reckless love what an abundant love what a loving god that we have man god we thank you thank you for that amazing worship session that we just had the reminder that it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out all our praise to you to you only. And God, may our praises reach you today. God, from the comforts of our homes where we are seated today as we watch this sermon and listen to this message, may our praises reach you. Praises for your love and your sustenance. Praises for your provision and your protection. Praises for everything that you do for us, God. The things we see and the things we never see. Praises, God, that you are the God who is faithful even when we are faithless. May you receive all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm so excited to be bringing uh, this um, someone to us today. And I want to say thank you, uh, not just to Lujan, but to our whole worship team for an amazing, amazing, amazing job that you did last month. Thank you, everybody in the worship team, our band. Uh, we give God praise for you. I want to also say that I'm so excited, so, so excited uh, over all the speakers that we have. Uh, last month, we had uh, Pastor Miruka. We started with Pastor Miruka. Then we had Candy, the amazing and beautiful Candy. And we had Grace Kanja, the amazing and gorgeous uh, Grace Kanja, who can manage to do seven minute sermons. While I only talk for seven minutes to introduce the sermon, we pray for bundles. May God give you and bless you with Wi-Fi and bundles um, this month. So we thank God for them. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, all the people who have a passion to teach and preach and speak God's word. And I, I look forward to having more faces here. And I know that you all look forward to having more faces on the screens. It could be your day next. Just get ready if that's the passion that God has given you. And we're looking forward to that. So, hey, where you are, uh, why don't you turn with me to the book of Joshua, uh, chapter 6. We're going to be reading a scripture that is so, um, you know, like one of those stories that we all know, one of those stories that I'm sure you were taught in Sunday school. Um, it's a common, common, common um, passage of scripture that has been used everywhere. There are songs written about it. And we're going to be reading from Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. And we'll skip and read a few more verses as we read from that chapter. So let's go. Joshua chapter 6. May God bless the reading of his word. 
<clears throat> That's what the Bible says. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Did you know that they marched for six days? Anyway, we'll come to that. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. Let's jump all the way. If you realize I'm reading from the NIV. So let's jump all the way to verse 12. And this is what God's word says. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord. When, while, while the trumpets kept sounding. Verse 14, so on the second day, they marched around the camp once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they cycled the city seven times. Verse 16, the seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast. Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Let's go to the conclusion of this story because we love it so much. It says, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. Don't we love that part? The wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with a sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. We thank God for his word. And I'm gonna pick it up from there because as I say, this is a story that we all know, right? And we've heard it from before. We know that these guys marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. There are even songs that have been written about it. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Beautiful story. And it's one of those that you can easily take and say, you know what? I'm going to be this guy who walks around walls <laughs> seven times just to see what happens. No, don't do that. Unless God has commanded you. But the thing that went on as I was reading this story it's because this story was reflecting on some of the seasons and the things that I'm thinking about in this season. I found myself in a place where I'm like, what kind of a matcha would I have been if I was part of this army? Because does it make sense to you that grown men used to wake up every single day for six days and go march around a wall? You know, let's imagine, in fact, let me talk to the ladies first in this, in this session over here. Imagine you're dating a guy. Let's give him a name. Choose a name at home. Um, if you're dating someone, you can use their name. But imagine you're dating a dude, yeah? And let's call the dude John or Johnny, right? And Johnny comes to you and he says, uh, you know, it's evening and he comes home and he's like, you know, you're like, hi, babe. How was your day? I was like, my day was all right. What did you do today? We, watched, we marched. Where? Round the walls. Which walls? Of Jericho. Why? Because Joshua said. Why? Because God told Joshua. Why? Because when we march on day seven, the walls are going to come down. And you're like, does, that, does, does that even add up? You know, guys will be looking at you. They're like, hey, how is Johnny? He's fine. Where is he? He's walking. Is he Johnny? The walker, right? Because every single day for six days, they marched around the walls and they came back home. I would have been the kind of matcher. 
I don't know about you. For me, this would have worked perfectly if like on day one, we marched and there was a crack on the northern side of the wall. And we all, after our marching, we went back to the northern side and we're like, my guy, I can see a crack. This added up. So let's come tomorrow. Tomorrow we have more psych. And the next day we come and we march and there's a tremor. You know the way, I don't know if you've ever been in a building that shakes. Like it, it kind of whistles, you know. And, and we're like, yeah, the second day what happened, there was a tremor. The third day, like it would have been so cool if every day after these guys marched, they came back with an update of what happened. Every single day, right? And then day five, Uko, we are like, you know, Hey, Maze, this is the day. This is the day. Let's see. Because with every single day, there was something to show for the matching. But that's not how this story is. You know? Why am I saying this? I've found that I want heaven to work differently for me. I wish heaven, you know, because they tell us we all have guardian angels. I wish my guardian angel and I had a status update meeting every Tuesday at nine in the morning. And we'd meet. Location doesn't matter. It could be Java, it could be at cafe, or it just as well could be in my room. Depending on how the angel feels, it's a status update. We could work from home. And we sit there and we're like, yo, how are you doing, man? I'm good. You know, highs and lows. What were your highs for the week? What were your lows? You can't ask an angel that. So he's the one asking you, what were your highs and lows for the week? And then we do a status update. All the projects that Frank is pursuing and all the things that Frank is doing. How are we doing on this? I wish heaven had that thing that we normally have. You know when you're downloading something and it tells you 77 minutes to go and you can plan your 77 minutes and then come back and say, now we're finished, let's move. Do you think it would be easier in life? If you all had like a dashboard that shows every project that you're doing and the upgrades and you know, like what, what is the status on this? What's the update on every single thing that you're doing with your life? It would have been easier for you and I to follow God if that's the way God worked. If, if we got text messages from heaven saying, you know, this prayer you've prayed uh, is going to be answered on Monday, the 5th of October, I don't even know what day that will be, but at, at 4 p.m., this prayer will be answered. It will be easier. But sometimes life feels like we're just doing laps, and we're doing laps, and we're doing laps. And by the fourth time, I'd have been the kind of matcha who'd have gone back to Joshua and said, my guy, call me when you need me. I'll show up when that time comes. The thing that I've learned in this season is that I don't know how to relate with God when he seems silent. I don't know how to relate with God when he seems silent. I'm not introducing a sermon series. Today I'm just sharing with what is going on in my life, with the places, the questions that I'm asking myself, because there's this question that has been going on as we are getting out of this, you know, stay at home, quarantine or self-isolation or physical social distancing season that we've been in. Uh, there's a question that people have been asking and that question is, what have you done in the last six months? And the other day I was with a friend of mine and we were, you know, just going through um, all the things that have happened and he was like, Frank, what have you done in the last six months? And when this, this season was starting, you and I were in that place where we were like, we had phys, uh, fitness goals. We, you know, were in that camp for learn a new skill, uh, learn how to cook something new. And we had all these, you know, things going on. But now it's six months on. And by the grace of God, we are starting to find forward, to emerge from whatever has been going on in the last couple of weeks. And everybody is asking, you know, Frank, what has been going on in your life for the last six months? And the other day I was just about to think and to sit down and say, here are the six things I've done in the last six months. And then I thought, maybe we need to rephrase this question and ask ourselves, what have these last six months made me? What have the last, what, what, instead of asking what has been going on in the last six months, maybe we need to ask, what have the, six the last six months done to me and done to you? 
And that's what I want us to talk about because in the last six months, one of the things that has happened to me is to come to the realization that I actually don't know how to relate with God when he seems silent. And this passage brings it out so clearly because had I been one of the, 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 the marchers going around that wall, by day four, me I'd have called Joshua aside and said, call me on day seven when you're marching the sixth time. Because we've all imagined that they marched on, on the seventh day seven times. But the reality of what this scripture says is that for six days, they used to march one day, go back home. March the next day, go back home. No result to report. Until the seventh day when they came. And then in the seventh walk, that's when the walls came down. How do you explain to people what you do? When every single day you go back home, you have nothing to show for the things that you should record and say, you know what, this is the progress that I've seen. What happens to you in seasons of life that appear like God is silent? The whole of last month we were looking at the life of a guy called Joseph and we followed him and followed him from him being thrown in a, in a pit. We followed him to him going to Potiphar's house. We followed him to him going into prison. And the thing about the prison is that he was in prison forgotten for two good years. Nothing happening. I don't know if that scripture struck you. But for two good years, there was nothing. In fact, there's a way the Bible records things sometimes because one verse says something and then the next verse moves on. For two years, nothing happened in Joseph's life. Nothing to record, nothing to show. How would you go to Joseph and now ask him, Hey, Joseph, what have you done in the last two years? I think a better question to have asked him at that point was, what have the last two years done to you? One is an external question, and as human beings, we love having results to show. The other one is an internal question. And it asks you to look deeper. And that's the thing that I'm inviting us to do today. Because for me, when I look deeply in my life, I'm like, I don't know how to deal with the seasons in my life when I'm doing everything I should be doing and I can't see the results that match the effort and the input. Six days of marching, six laps on the seventh day, there's nothing to show for. No cracks, no shakes, no tremors, no earthquakes. No indication from heaven, you know, a thumbs up from heaven and you're like, yeah, you guys are doing great. Nothing to show for those days. And as I was thinking about this and praying through it, a phrase that I must have heard a while ago came to me. Must have heard it from a someone somewhere or read it in a book. And this phrase reads something like this. It says, listen, Frank. Because I'm addressing myself in this someone as well. And to whoever is listening to me, listen to this. Do not equate God's silence with God's absence. Do not equate God's silence with God's absence. The fact that you can't see, because we, we love hype, man. And we love action. We love updates. You know, we love knowing what, what progress reports. We love everything that is a marker of progress and a marker of, you know, we are making moves. This is the way we are going. Day one, we did this. Day two, we did this. But then the scripture tells us for six days they saw nothing. I just heard it loud and clear. God saying to me, Frank, listen to me. You have to learn not to equate my silence with my absence. Just because I'm not saying and doing anything does not mean that I'm absent from this scenario. And I went, I was watching a sermon by one of my favorite preachers the other day. And he gave a story. And he said the way him um, and some of his church members 
went on a trip to Israel. And they went around the places, you know, when you go um, to those trips, um, you know, uh, you, you go to the places where Jesus walked and you're taken to the places, you know, you're told this is where Jesus did this, this is where Jesus did that. I've not been to Israel. I think it's a really cool thing that we should do um, as collective. We should all go to Israel um, and hopefully all of us will come back. Um, but the thing is, this preacher says they were taken uh, to different places. And one of the places where their tour guide took them was on this mountain. And he walked them up to the top of the mountain and told them, you guys, come up to the top. I want you guys to see something. And he took them up to the top of the mountain and he told them, I want you to see. And these guys were looking around and they're like, what, what? we can't see anything other than the sea. Right? You get that. We can't see anything other than the sea. And, and they're at the top of the mountain and the guy is silent. He's quiet. He's like, what are we meant to see? It's like those times when people ask you like a really simple riddle and you're like, I don't think this is, this is going somewhere. They, and the guy is just like, yeah, I want you guys to see something. And they're up there at the mountain and they're looking around and they're just seeing the sea. And after a few minutes, this guy comes to them and tells them, listen, aren't you guys to note something? The story that is given in the book of Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus sent the disciples ahead in a boat, and they went ahead and then, you know, the boat was being hit by storms and winds. And, and Jesus sent them ahead on a boat. Then he went up to the mountain to pray. And they were just going through this stormy sea. All sorts of things happening to the boat. And he just was away praying. And they were navigating the sea through the evening into the night. And then Jesus caught up with them by walking on water. Matthew chapter 14, if you know that story, yeah? And this guy, this tour guide tells uh, this group of people who are visiting Israel, he tells them, listen, I want you to know something. That Jesus was up on this mountain praying and the disciples were down on that sea, navigating the sea through the storms. And guys are like, okay, that's cool. And this guy looks at them and he says, there's something I need you guys to get. That for every minute that the disciples were spending in that stormy sea, Jesus could see them from the top. Of the mountain. That whole evening as they were trying to get their way through the stormy sea, Jesus could see them from the top of the mountain. And then at some point he decided to walk on water and to catch up with them. You know? And it's, it's one of those things that you, you listen to and you're like, I, how come it's not in the Bible that way? But it's one of those things that you listen to and you're like, yeah. Just because God is silent does not mean that he's absent. And then sometimes we find ourselves navigating stormy seasons in life. And in those stormy seasons, we're like, God, where are you? Where are you? I can't see you. I can't feel you. And I, I just listened to that story and it calmed my heart and my mind to know that my God does not sleep. He does not slumber. His eye is constantly and consistently on me. And when it bids for him to come, even water won't stop him. He'll walk and catch up with me wherever it is that I'll be. For as long as they were navigating through the sea, he could see them. Don't equate God's silence with God's absence. That's the thing that I want us to live with today. Because we are people of action. We love action. We love, we love to see progress. We love to, to hear how things are going. We love updates every single day. If heaven had a weekly update report for you and I, it would have been easier for us to follow God and to know that God is with us. But that's not how God works. He works with us learning to have faith and to trust him. Yeah. One of the most fundamental events in the Christian calendar is the death and resurrection of Christ right? And, and Friday, when you think about the day that Jesus died, the, from morning of that day, there was action. He was being, you know, nailed on the cross. There was a lot going on. He had to carry the cross. He was nailed on it. He died. And then there was the curtain tearing and there was darkness in the whole land. There was an earthquake, as Matthew records, and there was action everywhere on Friday, right? 
And then, and then on Sunday, when you think about it, there's also action on Sunday. People are going to the, to the tomb and they're coming back and they're being told, hey, you guys, you're looking for him in the wrong place. He's resurrected. They're running everywhere, getting to tell Peter and to tell the disciples, Jesus has risen. There is action on Sunday. And so there is action on Friday. There is action on Sunday. But there is a day in between here called Saturday when nothing is recorded. The tomb is closed. Nobody knows what was going on on that day until you and I realize that that's the day when we read the Apostles' Creed, it says he descended into hell. That the day that seems to be the most silent day of the three days, Jesus was in the depths of hell, pulling the gates of Hades apart to set you and I free. But you and I don't know that because the tomb was closed, the cross is empty, where is the Savior? It's on the silent days that victories are won. We don't equate God's silence with his, uh, his absence. And many of us have found ourselves in a place where we don't know where God is and we are questioning, we're like, where is God in my season? I can't seem to see him. I can't seem to feel him. Don't we love the song that we normally sing and our worship song sang it, that even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. As the seasons of silence in our lives are the seasons we need to activate our faith the most because God is at work. We don't follow a God who's going to park the car and say, you know, even me, let me just see how this crisis is going. God is never in crisis. And I hope that this message reaches to you and I hope it gets you wherever it is that you are. Do not equate God's silence with his absence. As we come to the end of this service, I just want to say that if there are people who experienced God in his fullness, that these guys called the Israelites, they saw God do great things for them. They saw God, you know, part the waters for them to walk. They saw God do miraculous things for them. But there's a passage in scripture that sends shivers down anybody who reads it. It's hidden. I don't know if you've ever read it, but I want to read it for you. Psalms, um, the, 70, the 78th Psalm. Yeah, the 78th Psalm, Psalm 78. I want us to turn to Psalms 78. I want us to read verse 41. Uh, from a passage um, or a version of scripture that is called the Passion Translation. And this is what it says. It says this, it says, Again and again, they limited God, preventing him from blessing them. Continually, they turned back from him and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Let me repeat that verse. It says, again and again, they limited God, preventing him from blessing them. Continually, they turned back from him and provoked the Holy One of Israel. The word, the word that I wanted us to get out of that is the word they limited God. They limited God. Again and again, they limited God. Yes, this season has been a silent season. But then the other thing that has happened in this season is that this season has been a season of many realities. I remember saying this to the collective in the hood uh, crew um, when we were shooting the last service. I was telling them that, you know, you have to think about the number of things that people have lost in this season. People have lost money, lost income, lost jobs, lost time in school. People have lost um, even their sanity. People have gone through all sorts of things in this season. And if you're thinking about these guys marching around the walls, and if you're thinking of the obstacles, the walls of Jericho were huge obstacles. There were huge, huge, huge walls that were built to guard the city. And then in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 6, it said that, that every gate was closed. Nobody could go in and nobody could come out. If you're thinking about obstacles, these guys had obstacles to face. 
And if the first lesson that we, we spoke about is do not equate God's silence with his absence, here's the second thing that I want you to pick from this passage, that I pray that may your view of God not rise and fall with the realities in your life. May your view of who God is not rise and fall with the realities around your life. That's what happened to the Israelites. Like these guys used to see God do great things like parting the sea and giving them manna and giving them bread to eat and supplying for them quills and giving them, you know, all sorts of things, miraculous things. But Psalm 78 verse 41 says that they limited God. It's like every time they hit a law, they, their view of who God is also like just went down and it hit a law. Do not allow the realities of this season to start limiting our expectations and your expectation of what God can do. The size of the walls and the size of the gates that are keeping you out from whatever it is that you are viewing as the possibilities of this season, I pray that they don't limit you from seeing and understanding that God is a great God. He didn't even need to go through the gates. Do you see that? Like, he, maybe these guys, as they were marching around the gates, they're like, yeah, maybe day seven, we'll just catch a guy opening the gate to peep where we are, and then we push, we push the gate, we push, we all get in. No, that's not what God was doing. He was like, I have a plan. You guys just march and praise. And on the seventh day, something is going to happen. Do not allow the realities of this season to limit the expectations of what God can do. I pray that your view of who God is does not rise and fall with the realities around your life. Like the higher the walls, the greater our God. The stronger the gates, the mightier our God. That with every obstacle that we come across, we lift God higher. That's what perspective does. Perspective continues. Faith continues to lift God on high. And that's what this passage teaches us. I pray for you, and I pray that may God lift you to the point and allow you to live to the point where the realities of your life never, ever dim out who he is. That is the true version of a faith that does not waver. That's the true version of it. I don't know where I was reading this or where I heard this from, but Michelle Obama tells this story. Yeah, I'm a Michelle Obama fan. I don't know where, how that goes, but I'm a Michelle Obama fan. And she tells this story. I think it's either in her book, Becoming, or it's in, in, in one of the talks that she gives. And she says that um, when she was in high school, she was studying, one of her, her um, classes was a French class that she was going through. And she was studying a French class. And part of the... Um, you know, the expectation when you're doing French, many of my friends who are studying French um, did this. They went to France. They had this tour where you go to France and you see the country, you learn the culture, and somehow it makes it easier for you to get the language um, because you understand the culture where the language comes from. And that trip was set for them in high school. They were meant to go to France. But Michelle says that when she looked at how much the trip was going to cost, she made up her mind that she was never going to tell her parents about it. She was never going to get excited about it. She was just going to kill it to herself, you know? And we do that a lot because she was like, you know, I know what my parents are going through to put me in school. Friend, uh, going to France is not one of the things, it's not a priority in our family right now. And that story ended and she moved on until one day her mother came to school to visit the teacher. I think it was like an open day. And the teacher was like, you know, yeah, we're happy, we're doing well. Yeah, your daughter is doing well in school. She's an, you know, a student and everything. But we're really bummed that she's not coming to France with us. And then Michelle's mom goes like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, we're going to, Fran uh, to France, but she's not coming because uh, she said that, you know, you guys can't afford uh, the trip at this time in your life. And the mom was like, oh, she said that? Okay. And then she says that she got home after school and she found her parents waiting for her, right? And she walked in and they're like, um, the, friend, uh, the, the, the trip to France. And she's like, yeah, 
um, I kind of, you know, didn't see the need to tell you guys about that trip because, you know, you're working so hard to put me in school and everything and I didn't want to cause any anxiety and everything like that. And then she says that her dad looked to her and her dad said this. She said, Michelle, you have to allow us to make that decision. You're not the one who makes that decision. We make that decision, not you. We make that decision. And she's like, okay. And then the parents look to her and they say, and you had better start getting ready because you are going to France. You see, the thing that happens to many of us is that we make decisions for God. We think through seasons and we think through everything that has gone on in the world. And we're like, maybe I shouldn't pray these kind of prayers because it's maybe not the right season to ask God for something like this. And it's maybe not the right time to trust God for something like this because I don't even know if I deserve it. And many of us have reached points where we've rationalized our dreams and our purpose and our expectations because we've made that decision for God. And I wanted you to hear a father who's looking to you today and says, and he says to you, do not, it's not your job to limit me. It's not your job to make the decision of what prayers reach God and what prayers do not reach God because you're like, am I asking for too much? You let God make that decision. This guy is limited, God. Will you? Will you limit God? Will you allow the realities of the season that we are in and the realities of life to start limiting what it is that you ask from God, what it is you expect from God? Or will you let God make that decision for himself? The Bible says this in Romans chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 19 to 23. I'm reading the message version. I'm not even going to explain this scripture. I'm just going to read this scripture about a man who refused to limit God. I'm going to read this scripture about a man who got the crown of being called the father of faith. And he's not talking about himself. This is thousands of years after he's, he's died that Paul starts to write about him. And let's read this together as we close our service. It says, Abraham, I'm reading from the message version, he says, Abraham did not focus on his own impotence and say it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child, nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. Listen to these words. It's, they say, he did not tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He did not tiptoe around God's promise, Asking cautiously skeptical questions, he plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. That's why it is said, Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. But it's not just Abraham, it is also us. The same thing gets said about us when we embrace and believe the one who brought Jesus to life when the conditions were equally hopeless. The sacrificed Jesus made us fit for God, set us right with God. Listen to me, collective. Are you going to equate silence with God's absence? Do not. Are you planning to start rationalizing and editing your dream because of the realities around you, do not. God's word tells you, Abraham did not tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. And it's maybe it's time for us to stop being skeptical and keep trusting God and to ask him to give us faith that carries us through the seasons of silence and the seasons when we are bombarded with the realities of what's going on in life. God bless you. Our hearts are open up for you. Give me faith to trust what you say that your good and your love is great. Trust what you say, and that you.
trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. You know, I may be weak, but you, God, are strong. My faith may waver sometimes, but God, you're faithful and you will carry me through. Thank you guys for joining us in our service today. Thank you, Luzan, for that amazing set of worship. And we pray that as we go into this week, may God be with you. As we go into this week, in fact, I want to release us this week that we go into this week with thanksgiving in our hearts. If for nothing, Psalm 121 verse 1 and 2 says this, If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say. If the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. If it was not for God, we'd not have been here today. To say, oh, you know, God has sustained us for the last six months. And may the God who sustained us for those last six months sustain you through the remaining part of this year. May he sustain you through the remaining part of your life, that your life may get to be a life that was a life on purpose, that lived for him, that served him. We pray that you will have a wonderful week. We pray that you will have a blessed week. We pray that this week, God may wake you up with a desire to pursue him, to read his word, to pray and to live in accordance to the holy journey that he's called you for. In Jesus' name, have a fantastic week. Hey, subscribe, share this someone with someone, share this service with someone. God bless you. We love you so much.